we got a little mayhem with Marge. If you are <laughs> not familiar with Marge, Marge has a lot of accolades and um, reputation is unprecedented. But what a lot of people don't know about Marge is Marge was one of the very first international realtors and her expertise back in the day was land surveying. And so she was actually, you know, part of the group that put together the land purchase and the construction of the Vatican so many centuries ago. <laughs> and so I was wondering where you were gonna go. So uh, we are <laughs> so we are very, very lucky. But I wanted to say this, Marge, because we, we don't have you on as much. We have a we have a lot of newer agents that don't necessarily really know what you do as far as your influence and and your contribution to the real estate community and industry over the last several decades. So uh, if you don't know Marge, you definitely need to pick up the phone, reach out and have a conversation with her and introduce herself. But, you know, I just want to say thanks for everything that you do for our community, because our younger agents just they don't understand what, you know, individuals like you and Dwayne Fouts and, you know, and people like that have brought to what we do in real estate. Uh, thank you. And I knew I was watching both Todd and Nick, like, where's he going with this? Well, let's see. Uh, one time I beat Moses down from, you know, <laughs> from the mountain. mountain. <laughs> yep, I, I beat him with the first contract. Uh, let's see, I, I picked Dirt. a rock for, for Plymouth Rock. Yep. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you are you you brokered the uh, Louisiana purchase. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Mike said one of the best benefits of working with somebody as old as me <laughs> is it cost him time to go back and search history to yeah. figure out what he was going to insult me with next. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's a pleasure, and and honestly, Mike, to to that point, we are so unbelievably blessed and fortunate with this company. Mm -hmm. I could not be prouder. And I tell each and every one of my classes how great it is. I mean, you look at our five brokers. You look at, as you mentioned, Dwayne as our designated broker, or Sue Fluky. Sue and Fluky, all I should have mentioned her, yeah. I mean, Sue is, yeah, totally. she's just a phenomenon in and of her own. We have many, many wonderful leaders in this company that have, and, and Todd, not to slight you. I mean, he's president oh, of an it. association yeah. of realtors well, so also. So you twice, and <laughs> plus AAR. So. But, I mean, there's just yeah. so much, and a lot of these are elected positions where you're recognized by your peers for all that you do, your knowledge and accomplishments, and so I'm surrounded by nothing but the best. And Nick and I are co-founders of the Boys Burger Club, so yeah. that's our contribution. <laughs> you're welcome, world. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's jump into uh, it. So a lot of these have to do with earnest money. And so I, I'm, we're not even going to go back and forth. We're just going to have a discussion um, because I, you, you know, must have read them already. I, well, I, I, I perused them, and, <laughs> but I opted not to research and find the answers oh, okay. um, because <laughs> there are, I mean, there's a lot of cra crazy scenarios that go on with earnest money. I think a lot of misconceptions about <laughs> earnest money. Uh, a lot of people get really ticked off at the title company and, and unjust, sometimes fairly, but most of the time unfairly because they don't understand how earnest money disputes work. Well, and if, if one of the things I want to do is give some credit here, <clears throat> excuse me, to Kristen Mack, who is the president of Arizona Premier Title because she presented this information at our Professional Standards Annual Workshop. And as being involved as she is in the title industry, she knows what they experience, what they see, and a lot of problems that we individually and as companies may not see as much or on an isolated basis. So I just told her, I'd like to steal your materials. And right. She said, absolutely. So. Right, so we got a lot to get to, so let's get to it. Uh, so scenario number one, buyer submits earnest, the earnest deposit 48 hours after contract acceptance. However, they deposit a personal check that is drafted from somebody else's bank account. Well, that's a red flag, I think, from the lender perspective. I think the lender's going to have a problem with that. But buyer fails to close during the cure period, and seller cancels and demands the earnest deposit. So should the escrow agent have accepted the deposit? And I don't that's a, it's a great question, because I guess I've never asked the question of whether the name on the check 
for earnest money needs to match the name on the contract. But I would say as far as the title company goes, I would say, yeah, go ahead and accept it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Because the argument has been they shouldn't do it because that name doesn't have anything to do with his transaction. Is it, that's not a title issue. Should they accept the earnest deposit? Absolutely. But then let's talk about other things. Yeah, but then that was where I was getting <laughs> to. So the challenge is for the lender, um, because now all of a sudden a non-borrower is now recorded as is submitting the earnest money. But that and so yeah, I think it would pose a challenge for the lender. Yeah, lending every every loan, every loan has a different loan guideline. And every banker, you know, uh, loan originator, their company maybe has an overlay on top of that that has additional instructions that require certain things. But in most cases, you, we have a duty to, uh, you know, for the buyer to uh, tell our buyer that they have a responsibility to contact the lender anytime there's going to be any monies that are added to the buyer side of the transaction. Well, and well, one thing that they don't want us to miss, and from a title perspective, when they say, should they have accepted the deposit, the answer, of course, is, as you just said, and I agree, is yes. But one of the other things they ought to get is a third-party authorization for yeah. that. And my understanding is several of our title companies are really good about doing that, but many of them just don't pay attention to it because they mm -hmm. haven't had an issue and then when they have a problem they think it's so isolated it's not necessary so the big concern is when you start looking at this okay do we have that third party authorization and from a lender's standpoint okay is this a gift letter you know have has the borrower come in with an appropriate amount down are they investing enough of theirs to secure this and have loan approval so there are a number of different issues that yes the lender needs to look at and the lender needs to be made aware of it too so so my question back in the old days uh when i got you know started in real estate we would actually i would have my buyer write a check and I would personally deliver it to the title company with the contract because uh -huh. we didn't really, you know, we weren't scanning things and we weren't emailing things and so forth. So I always had that opportunity to take a look at the check. I have not seen an earnest money check in years because now the title company goes and picks it up and, and so forth. So I don't ever really ever get to put my eyes on it. So my question is, is there some sort of responsibility on the escrow agent to, to reach out to me as the buyer's agent or reach out to the lender just saying, hey, just want you to know that the earnest money, the name on the earnest money check is not matching what's they on the should. contract? That's, they that's the recommendation. Yeah. They should. And oftentimes, you know, that third party authorization will notify everybody of that so that everybody's aware. Because you'll see, you know, the next thing is, you know, when we start asking about this, okay, what about the forfeitability of the funds and, and what should happen when somebody turned it in? So they're saying, yeah, when the title company receives this, then they should at least notify everybody involved that it's a different name so that if there is any kind of a concern, it can be discussed right up front. And most importantly, from that lender's perspective, right. too. So I want to get to the next one. So <laughs> our the earnest funds of able to, to the seller? I would say yes. However, I would just ask the question on the mere fact that the person's, the, the person, the name of the person who's on that check doesn't match the name of the person on the contract. Does that throw in a curveball to this? Because could that person say, hey, listen, I'm not part of the contract. And so, therefore, seller, you can't keep my earnest money. And that's an argument right that comes money. up. Yep. And they say that's one of the reasons to stress and ask for that third-party authorization mm -hmm. because that clarifies it <clears throat> so that if and when you run into this, fine. Because the seller, of course, is going to say, yeah, it has to be forfeited to me. The third party who issued the check may argue it. Mm -hmm. So you avoid this by discussing it from the beginning. And so, and that goes back to this last one on this page. And I know this scenario is a, a two slide scenario, but so are there any steps escrow should take when the funds are received from someone other than which the buyer, which I think you've, yeah. we've discussed. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, so, okay. Does the seller have the right to know that the funds did not come from the buyer? 
Um, I I would I would say yeah. Yeah, I was going to say just yeah. a simple answer. Yep. See, yeah. I'm not trying to stump you here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank yes. you, Marge. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And so then again, that just comes back down to the escrow agent because right. because as a buyer's agent, I wouldn't know unless the escrow company told me. Correct. And should the lender be notified that the funds did not come from the buyer? And I would say at 100 percent, absolutely. Yep. Now I don't know, Marge. What what did Kristen say with regard to if there was a third party authorization? Was was all the notification still required? Was what uh, if if there was a third party right, notification? Right. Are all is the would the escrow service company still be responsible for notifying everybody that the check was different? Well, I think that that would be covered with that with that notification. But yeah, it's, it should because the third party no <coughs> notification would automatically get sent to everybody. Exactly. That's that's what what my understanding of it is. And if we have you know somebody out there who is listening involved in that part they, they might clarify it, but that's my understanding once you have that then all of the parties are notified and it also explains what happens if 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 okay so <laughs> let me just then take it another step so let's say this happens uh seller now is notified that that the check that the earnest money check the name on the earnest money check does not match the buyer can the seller require something different, cure them, or do they just have to take it as it is? I'm, I'm not aware. Now that, Now you're getting into some legal questions mm -hmm. that I can't answer. I like to stump but... you every once in a while. <laughs> you can't stump me. I just pass it off on somebody else. <laughs> no, but uh, in, in all actuality, I don't believe, I mean, the, could the seller say no? And the answer is yes. Could the seller say no, I, I want it here, I want to be sure? You know, that's as with anything. But would they? Yeah. I doubt that. And it's going to open a civil issue anyway, <laughs> because there's nothing in the terms and conditions of the contract that says it has to be the buyer's from the buyer's money. Correct. So that's that's why I'm saying. Could yeah. the seller say, well, wait, I had a certain. Well, then my, my advice would be then if you're in that situation, yep. you're the listing agent and this scenario happens, I would pick up the phone and I would call that buyer's lender and just have that conversation with sure, them you know? sure and that's why you find from the get-go if, if there's an issue if there's a problem you know if, if a gift letter is needed if something else is needed all right yeah all right number two all right so the buyer buyer deposits the earnest money within the 48-hour period copies of the receipt were provided to both agents oh, this is a good one <laughs> three days later escrow receives a notice from the bank that the funds have failed to clear. So the escrow agent reaches out to the buyer's agent informing them that the funds did not clear and the buyer's agent advises escrow that the buyer will bring a new check. Now, if we stop right there only because we've, I've given you so much in this, yep. in this case, the escrow agent should have notified Correct. both agents. And, and that's one red flag here. They should have notified both, but go ahead. And then I'd also say then as a, as a listing agent, you cure right away. I would cure it, right? Okay. Okay. I mean, because if, <laughs> if, if they didn't bring in earnest money and it didn't clear, I would, you're, okay. Yeah. Todd's shaking his head. No, I'm, I'm acknowledging. I, in fact, I think that's a reasonable thing to do. All right. So, uh, my buyer fails to bring in good funds with 24 hours of buyer's agent being notified. Yeah, the, the 24 hours is not an issue anymore. Yeah. Because escrow, already exceed the first one. Yeah. <laughs> escrow agent then provides notice to both agents that earnest funds were returned and buyer has not replaced the funds. Close of escrow date passes and seller cures the buyer for failure to close. Again, well, I would have I would have cured a lot earlier yeah. than that. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, buyer fails to close during the cure period, and seller cancels and demands the earnest money. Is the seller able to cancel escrow? Uh, if if the cure period has come and gone, I would say yes. I agree. The caveat to that, though, is, and it's always a good reminder. Once your seller claims earnest money, then they forfeit their right for any any future, yeah. um, you know, lawsuits. Under or, the terms breach in the contract, right. right. So your seller's always got to pick yeah. one or the other. Do they want the earnest money 
or do they want to go after more money through, uh, you know, litigation? Well, yeah, it says can the seller cancel. It didn't say can they cancel and get the owner's money. <laughs> so, yeah, can the seller cancel? Sure. Um, you know, and then again, uh, can they go to court and, and file to collect the money that the buyer had originally pledged? I'm not an attorney. Um, I would say that. Oh, that's right. There's no, fail, right. There's no money in escrow. There's no money in escrow. I would right imagine now. that if the if the buyer failed to do something that was a covenant to the terms and conditions of the contract, and the seller had damages, then the seller could go to civil court if they opted and uh, and try. And I don't know. No, I think you're you're right on here. And the whole point here. So often when we hear that okay, the money isn't there, but don't worry about it because they're gonna have them resubmit it, they're gonna do this, they're gonna do that. I like what you said, Todd, and that is so often we don't cure because the fear is it's gonna upset the other side and here we go. Well, to issue a cure does not have the same effect as saying we're gonna cancel. Curing something does not automatically mean we're going to cancel a transaction. And if you're concerned about how the other agent's going to react, which is often what we hear, mm -hmm. then pick up the phone and call them mm -hmm. and tell them, by the way, you know, when I learned this on behalf of my seller, we're going to issue the cure. Doesn't mean we're going to cancel necessarily, but we need to be sure that it's, you know, in place, it's taken care of. And so often we don't issue that cure notice. Yeah, no, the cure, the cure is a mutual uh, agreement or a mutual understanding that a potential breach may have occurred. Right. You know, and that's really all it is. And if it's taken at that on its face value, then yeah, it's a very I agree constructive with, document. I agree with you, Marge. You can't, I mean, honestly, you're going to struggle in this business if you're afraid of the cure notice. Right. Uh, we, we have a fiduciary responsibility to be bulldogs for our clients when it comes down to negotiations. But... I don't ever, I've, I don't think I've ever sent a cure notice without at least picking up the phone and, and letting that other agent business. know and having that conversation. Yeah. So if you're afraid of sending a cure notice, then get a coach, <laughs> join a team, yeah. and, 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 you know, become a little bit more of a bulldog, you know, in this situation. Or even if, if they don't have to be a bulldog. You know, in this case, but just understand if you're going to be the advocate for your client mm -hmm. and, you know, work with them, you need to do this. It's an option and an opportunity that's available that we I, often ignore. I, I am not here to <laughs> coddle the other agent. No, but, <laughs> right? but we can either be competitive or collaborative. No, but I'm just saying there's, a, there's a way to know. do it. Right. But you, but you have to do it. Because my concern is. in this situation, I'm really not concerned about the earnest money. I'm concerned about the rest of the deposit. If, if, yeah. if they don't have the funds yeah. to clear the earnest money, so you've definitely got a cure. And so the question is, was there anything else the seller could have done earlier and that would have and been cured cure. right. yeah. initially? Right. Exactly. Right. And, and Todd's correct with where we're going to go. So it ends up, it, you know, you've got nothing. The escrow's been canceled. Everything has happened. Okay. And he may have to go to small claims court, superior court, depending upon the dollar amount. Mm -hmm. That's involved. But you're not going after just escrow for the fact of earnest because of earnest. You're going after earnest because it was pledged in the contract and it was a failure of a covenant of the contract for the buyer to perform that. Yeah. Only if the seller had damages, too. <laughs> yeah. So then the other question is, let's say we cure right away. Cure period comes and goes. There is no additional earnest money. Seller cancels the contract. Can they still go to court and go after the earnest money, even though their close of escrow is still out in the future? Meaning, like, I, I cure them on day three because the, we got notified that the funds didn't clear. So now day seven comes and goes, cure notices come and gone, seller cancels the contract because there is no earnest money in there. But can now that seller go to court and go after the earnest money that was never successfully uh, deposited? Yeah, that guy's going to go back to damages again. You know, you really, what would have happened if there was earnest money and during the inspection period on the last day, the 10th day, the seller, the buyer decided they didn't want it. They stated a reason what's going to happen. They're going to get their earnest money back. So the really, the seller hasn't really exceeded any or, or been in a situation that's causing any damage until at least the end of the inspection period. I was just going to say, my big question is, what were the damages, right. if any, <clears throat> you know, as to how strong it's going to be when mm -hmm. it prevailed? Okay. Uh, that would be my thought. But, you know, when they asked also, then can the escrow or the seller require 
replacement funds. So all of a sudden, it's not there, and they're being assured verbally <laughs> that the money is going to be there. Can they say, no, wait, now I want a cashier's check, or I want good funds wired? You know, I'm going to say no. The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Because is, is that in the contract? Uh, um, no. So then now, now the title company, to me, I'm reading this, now the title company is now changing the terms and conditions of the no, purchase contract. But, but they, you would be doing it when, say, when the escrow or the seller require it, it would be upon somebody's instruction. In other words, it's not going to be the escrow officer that says, hey, you have to come in with certified funds. But we often then ask the title company to make that demand for us, yeah. you know, to do it. So they would only be involved if that was the request from the seller or through the seller's agent in that but, transaction. But again, there, we're now changing the terms and conditions of the contract. And so I don't, I personally, and I'm not a broker, but I don't see, I, I, I as a buyer's agent, I would say no. Well, but at the end of the cure notice, the seller, or I'm sorry, the buyer now is in breach. Is in breach. Prior to that, they're in noncompliance. Okay. Right now, they're in breach. So you can renegotiate mm -hmm. at this point. It's like saying, okay, okay. the only way I'm going to continue on now is if you put up the money non-refundable. Now you can renegotiate or cancel. You've got some options. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Scenario number three. The buyer actually deposits earnest funds. <laughs> 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 the close of escrow date passes, and the buyer fails to close. Seller cures the buyer, and the buyer does not comply during the cure period. Seller's agent has the seller cancel the contract, and then the seller's agent demands that the earnest deposit be forfeited to the seller. Uh, can the seller's agent speak on behalf of the seller at this point in the transaction? Um, I guess I, I... Never without instruction. That's what, Yeah, so I, I guess I feel like I'm missing a piece of the information. I can... Um, I, all I know is how I handle the situation. Um, I pick up the phone with my seller, I have the conversation, giving, give them their options, and then I email them get authorization from them to then forward that information onto the escrow agent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's how I handle the situation. Okay. Now, it, when we're talking about this, you know, and they have canceled, can they speak on behalf? The answer is no. Right. But in that scenario, the why escrow cl uh, didn't close, your relationship has ended. And I'm the canceled. listing agent. I have you, that relationship. Not at but, the end of the con Nope. Once, once it all ends, your agency relationship ends. And when that agency relationship ends, you can't speak for them any longer. But I have the listing. I, I, I have an ER signed. And the expiration of the ER goes beyond the close of escrow in this transaction. So okay. I'm confused. Okay. Again, two, different, go ahead. Go ahead. two different duties. Yeah. And here you're talking about the earnest funds and so forth with this. And the best, the best I can tell you is that they're saying once your relationship with them in that part ends because you know they've now failed to they failed to close you know and could be that it's after the termination of you know the listing time there could be so many other things involved and right. the only point they were trying to make for us with this one is watch with the timing because if the escrow itself has canceled, if it has closed, if your relationship with them has ended, you can't speak for them any longer because your agency relationship has ended. But so, can I relay <laughs> information on their behalf? Uh, I'm going to go to the very last question here and kind of give everybody a little bit of a break to sure. ponder that. Is there a reason the seller may not want to? In my personal opinion, that's the reason an agent doesn't get involved because you don't know what the seller's thinking. Is the seller thinking, you know what, I don't want the earnest money. I think I'm going to take them to small claims or I think I'm going to take them to court. To Mike, your earlier point in question number one, um, the seller has the right to take the earnest money, but if they do, it's their sole right to damages. They can't go back right. and get damages anywhere else. So in this particular point, I'm just saying the reason I said without seller instruction, if in this example the listing were still going to be longer than the expiration of this, I would say that the agent never wants to be the one who says what they want. They should be going back to the seller. 
explaining the options to the seller, and then say, letting the sell, and then saying to the seller, you know, you may want to consider seeking real estate legal advice. Uh, but then, know, if if, so. if if and so if if they've canceled the contract, though, uh, I and, and if I'm hearing you right, then in this particular situation, I can't even go back now and advise them well, of their no. options. See, and again, on the first one, we're saying, can they do it at this point? That's if everything has been canceled, if everything is done, if your agency and fiduciary duty relationship has terminated. Now, when it asks, is it ever appropriate for them? Yes, under your situation, I still have my exclusive right to sell. I still have my fiduciary duties and responsibility. And even our listing forms give us the right you know, to speak on their behalf and represent them in certain circumstances. So I would say, you know, it depends again on the situation, but I would agree with you, Mike, that if I still have that ER, I can still, with their authorization, and usually it's best to get that in writing, I can go ahead and pass this information on on their behalf. So we had an agent a couple of years ago who basically told escrow to send the earnest money to the seller in this similar example. And the seller, upon receipt, said, what's this? And the agent said, well, I acted quickly, and I requested to get your earnest money back. The agent, the seller said, I don't want my earnest money back. That's my sole right. I want you to, I'm going to redeposit this with escrow because I'm taking them to court. And so it just muddied the water because now an agent was doing something without the true instruction from That's their client, the even if yeah. you were still under an exclusive right to sell or rent. You never, ever, ever, based on the way that con that those questions are asked, you never, ever speak on behalf of a seller without instruction from the seller, period, end of story. Yeah, and having it in writing, mm -hmm. that is so essential and yeah. something we don't yeah. often think about. Right. Well, now now I'm scared to death because now if I've got it in writing, <laughs> it's time stamped. <laughs> right? That's what you want. You know, no, I, I, so so yeah. the point of the matter is, is, is if we know this is coming down the pipe and we know that we are going to cure him and we know and we've had a discussion with the seller that we are going to cancel the contract upon the expiration of the, the cure notice, here are your options. Right. These are the avenues in which you, you could go. And we, you know, and then I guess once this happens, you now need to relay your wishes to escrow. Yeah. And the other thing is, in, you know, just like you were talking about the coaching earlier and the essential and the benefits of that, there's some, there are some agents also who are afraid to say, talk to an attorney get a legal opinion. What are the options here? What's the likelihood of success in doing this? Uh, have I met the criteria to be successful with this? Th those types of questions. And yet, at the same time, that could be the very best answer. Because even here this morning, with these discussions, some of these things, an attorney is the best you know, to respond to. Right. And you've got to understand that it's not a negative when you say that to them. You can just tell them, you know, as we've alluded to, I'm not an attorney. Right. Here's my opinion based on my experiences, but there are so many more out there, and you can get some It's guidance. a lot easier to look at this, Mike, from the perspective of a buyer's <laughs> side of a deal that cancels, or closes, for that matter. It closes, and then all of a sudden your buyer, who's the new owner, calls you on the phone and says, hey, I just noticed all these defects of the property. I need your help. Well, that's a problem, because yeah. realistically, the moment that that property help. closed, you're no longer their agent. Correct. Yeah, and it, and it, and it's the fine line. There's there's the black and white, and then sometimes there's just the real world. So so my question, we we only have a couple minutes, but like I um now I'm safe. It's a completely different situation. But I was with a, an investor yesterday. Invited me to his home. He's thinking about doing this and that. And how do you you know like because because it can relate to this situation. How do you handle the question in this situation when your seller says? What would you do? Tell them. Okay. I have no qualms with that. You know, just, Personal you know, opinion. what I do may not be th the best thing for you. Mm -hmm. You know, and there I can, I can and can and will happily share with you my thoughts and what I do because I think, you know, they obviously trust you. They like you. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be doing business with you and seeking your advice. So I don't have any okay. problems with that. Not at all. All right. But yeah, because he was asking me about you know, selling his house, renting his house, staying in his house. And he's like, he's like, what would you do in my situation? Sure. And I'm like, well, if this was my house, this is what I would do. But 
Here are your options. And you never say, if I were you, this is what I'd do. Yeah. No, it's me. This is what, this I, is what, would what I would do. Yeah. And what's best for you exactly. is the decision you're going to have to reach. All right, so uh, Nick's been keeping score. I scored 15. Todd, you scored 12. So, <laughs> boom. March 1. <laughs> Another. <laughs> <laughs> March. Yeah, I want to recount. <laughs> March, thank you very much. Uh, My always pleasure. enjoy it. <laughs> All right, leave everybody with the quote of the day. Blessed is the season which engages the whole world in a oh, conspiracy man. of love. love you it. guys are you guys are really <laughs> this is good. I'm, what are you guys doing to me? I got to like, now look up the marketing Hamilton team laughed real hard when I, I almost I almost this morning just created a, created my own quote for you. Please don't. Please stop quoting yourself during podcasts. <laughs> All right. I appreciate everybody joining us today. Go out and sell a home. <laughs>